What's going on guys and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Garrett. I'm a seven figure Amazon seller showing you guys how you can make a living off Amazon as well. In today's video, we're talking about the reasons why new Amazon sellers are failing. I realize that there are a ton of new sellers joining the space each and every day, each and every week. And so these are important to realize that a lot of mistakes are made early on with the data in which new sellers are consuming and the purchases that they are making. So stay tuned for the video and enjoy. So as we really start to dive into the different reasons why Amazon sellers are failing, you'll see a common theme. And a lot of it comes down to the data in which newer sellers are consuming or the lack thereof, right? Getting overindulged in maybe one factor or two and not really seeing the entire picture of a product. That's why I'm so keen, especially in the beginning, in creating a checklist of every single item that you want to be double checking before you buy a product. What's the velocity? What's the purchase price? Is the offer count spiking? Is there a seller that's dominating? All these sorts of things we'll walk through. But it's important as you are making your buying decisions in your first two, three, four, six months that you are really looking at the entire cumulative picture of what a product means, what the product has done, because really that's going to give us a good indication of what the product will do in our business. So as we start to dive into the very first point I want to make in terms of why Amazon sellers fail, especially getting going, is the 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 idea of buying based on current price rather than historic price. And this is a good example, right? If we look at this Keeper graph, we can see the history of the product is, you know, between around $20, $19, maybe some, maybe some spurts in $22, $24. However, and this is where this is the detriment of a lot of leads lists that are in the space right now. This point right here is problematic, right? You see what happens. The entire history of the product is you know around 1920 right especially in this time frame right here however currently what is the product priced at it's spiked at 30 for whatever reason probably lack of sellers however nonetheless the buy box is now 31 and so the problem becomes if we start to make our purchasing decisions based on this spiked price without evaluating the trending the norm of the product market Oftentimes, if we are buying, expecting it, and needing a price point of 30 to make money and make our margins and things like that, what happens is when inevitably the product restores and, and kind of falls back into its normal state, which the consumers have dictated and the Amazon sellers have dictated, we're going to get cut, right? So if we're buying this somewhere between 14 and 16, expecting to sell it at 31 and make a 4 or $5 profit, well... Ultimately, when we have to sell at 21, now we're losing money, all right? And so the very, very first point I want to make in today's video is that we need to be buying based on the accumulation of historical data, not necessarily what the price is now, but what the price has been. And again, that's oftentimes the, the detriment of a lot of leads lists because they are sourcing and filling their leads lists based on current price. But we need to be smart enough to really evaluate and ignore this spiked price in favor of the accumulation of historical product. That's not to say you can't make money up here. You can. However, if you're building your business in markets like this, the very short-term markets, you're over the long haul, you're probably going to end up losing money because most of these markets end up restoring to the norm, which is right here around 20, right? So you can buy this product, but I would suggest buying this product around 8 to 10 rather than 15 when we're having to rely on the increased market. So that's, n that's point number one, and it's really, again, not buying based on the accumulation of historical price data. It's ba buying based on the current. Second one, velocity is going to be a big thing when we are making our decisions, right? We need to have some sort of idea in terms of how much a product is going to sell because we use that to obviously forecast how many we're going to buy. Now, in this case, this happens to be a pretty fast-moving product 1,600 times. However, as we dig deeper, as we peel back the layers – there, it becomes pretty pro Hey, quick commercial break. I appreciate you guys supporting and following the channel. If you are enjoying this particular video, which I'm assuming you are if you're still watching it to this point, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Scroll down, hit that subscribe button. Helps me out, helps the channel out. Let's get back to the content. Now, first red flag is, and I talk about this a bunch, flat buy boxes often lead to red flags, often lead to scenarios that we don't want to be a part of. Now, I can tell you why. Every time we buy a product, we want to be going into the data, the buy box statistics, 
to get an idea of the entire split share of the buy box, right? We want to see some rotation here. We want different third-party sellers getting action because if we come into the market and we can't forecast a share of the buy box, then we won't make sales. And now in this particular scenario, these are ones we want to avoid Anytime there's a majority holder of the buy box, whether it be Amazon or whether it be a third-party seller, or in this case, probably the brand, right? we want to have an idea of when there's a majority holder of the buy box, whether it's 80%, 90%, 100%, or whatever the case may be, a big share, right? because whether this is 70% or 80% or 100%, it's going to skew our numbers, right? And so we need to be estimating our sales velocity based on the buy box ownership, based on the buy box diversity. And we need to account for, right, if one seller is gaining 60, 70, 80% of the buy box, well, there's no longer 1,500 sales on the table. It's 1,500 and then minus 70, 80%, minus whatever that buy box holder is. Now, in this case, we certainly want to avoid this because the brand is owning 100% of the buy box. And so this is going to be problematic regardless. But even if it wasn't the brand and they were owning 60% of the buy box, well, 60% is enough, is enough to skew our velocity estimate significantly. So that's something we, all, we ought to be accounting for in our sales forecasting metrics, things like that. Now, the same listing we can use for our next point in terms of why Amazon sellers fail, and it's IP issues, right? We can see corresponding with the flat buy box, you see there's always one seller in this listing. Now... Anytime, and this is a general rule of thumb, anytime there's only one or two sellers, sometimes even three sellers on a particular listing, that's oftentimes going to be uh, an area or a listing where you're going to get an IP complaint. IP complaint is just simply when you go on a listing, a brand or a certain seller is monitoring that listing. They have um, exclusive privileges to sell that product. And with us entering that market, they say, we don't want you on the listing. They contact Amazon. They get you kicked off. They file an IP complaint. It shows up on your account health. A lot of not fun things, right? And so any listing that's, you know, one or two sellers, oftentimes corresponding with a flat buy box, are listings that we want to be avoiding because account issues are no fun. They will ruin your day, and they will close your account if you get enough of them. Um, so that's something we want to be mindful of. That's number three. Number four is the this action right here, right? This activity right here. And you see what happens is, right? This is something that, again, happens a lot with a lot of the bolo -y type items that we run into, but it's this item right here. If you're buying right here, and so, right, we will take this, for example. If we're looking at this product right here, for example, right, 26 offers, the price is pretty stable, but 26 offers. But if we look in the past couple weeks, Offers went from 12 to 18 to 20 to 22 to 24 to 26, 28, 30, 40, 50, so on and so forth, right? This increasing of offer count really quickly is going to be a red flag. It's going to be something we're going to want to avoid because if you notice, right here when the offers are at 12, the price is at 61, right? Right here when the offers are at 41, the price is, is at 51, right? When the pre offers are maxed at, 75, the price is now 48. This increase in offer count is always, always, always going to result in a de decrease in price, right? You can take it to the bank. Increase in supply with no corresponding increase in demand, which is, is pretty hard to do on Amazon, results in the only thing that's possible, which is a decrease in price. Happens every time. Well, most times. Um, and so anytime we're looking at a listing, even if it's, you know, we're up here or somewhere like, like somewhere in the middle here, we want to be avoiding listings where the offer count is, is in the process of spiking because you can no longer rely on the current market in those certain scenarios, right? It's always going to result in a future drop in price, right? Keep that in mind as we're looking at products moving forward. The next is variation listings. Now, these are interesting because there's a ton of, ton of, ton of opportunities with all different variation listings, grocery flavors, um, beauty products, shoes, clothing, apparel, whatever, right? But the thing is we have to be very sure of which variation we're getting and what to expect from that particular variation. Now, in this case, this one doesn't really help us because there's not an actually estimated sales number. But, for example, let's, let's make... Uh, 
let's imagine that number is called 5,000 or 1,000, whatever the case may be. There's a kind of a process that we go through to really evaluate different variation metrics. Now, the big point is this sales rank and this estimated sales number, I know they're unknown, but imagine they are cumulative, right? And so that means all the different color sizes, et cetera, are all contributing to the sales rank and are all contributing to the estimated sales number over the course of a month. And so if we're going to buy this size 12 and it shows 2,000 times, it doesn't mean this size 12 and white is selling 2,000 times. It means the entire listing is selling 2,000 times. And we need to figure out how many this size 12 and white is actually selling. Amazon makes that pretty easy, right? We can go into the variation listing, uh, variation uh, page, and identify the portion of the ratings that are going to a specific size, right? And I'm not going to get too concerned over the 5% as opposed to 4 or 3, et cetera. We just want to get close. So we just want to be aware is if we're looking at a listing down here that's only getting, you know, 3% of reviews over the span of the product, that's something that we're going to want to avoid or at least account for in the amount of units we're buying, right? And so another reason why sellers are failing is because they're buying too many of the wrong variations, tying up cash, creating issues, and not allowing us to continue to scale. And so the point here is that anytime we're looking at a variation listing, we just have to do that extra step. We have to really dive deeper in terms of A, a what is the overall velocity? B, what is the velocity going to this particular variation? And C, what's the competition on that variation? Because you'll know a lot of times these higher variations also have more competition, right? So granted, they have, you know, the most, vari the most velocity in this listing, but they also have the most competition, or I guess these two. But as we scroll down, these are, st you know, still getting decent velocity, right? This one's priced at 175, 27 r ratings. Uh, but I was on it. So this one, for example, right? 177, only six offers to compete with. This is a lot more of a interesting market because there's less competition the price is higher and the price is stable and it's still getting velocity it's still getting sales um, you'll notice also all the different buy boxes are, are changing and that's individual to that specific variation last point and it's not necessarily data related in terms of why amazon sellers are failing and it's kind of alluded to in this variation listing is is just general cash flow practices right a lot of times Sellers, you know, as soon as they start to get comfortable with what they're looking at, confident in their purchase, they, they, they try and buy all sorts of products, tie up cash, get stuck with credit card debt, and that's a losing predicament, right? You're never going to be buying enough profit where you can outlast credit card interest, right? So keep that in mind. Be smart as you're scaling. Be smart as you're managing your cash. Always have enough in the background to pay your credit card bills and you'll have a successful business long-term to show for it. That's it for today's video, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you in the next one.